Right. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be unto God, the Lord of the worlds. For we are in our session number 10, uh, the 10th week. One of the strangest things Lord, that Lord, happened Lord, Lord. Um, this week. Um, Muhammad Ali, can you, Muhammad Ali, can you mute your microphone, please? Thank you. Um, strangest thing happened this week. Um, for some reason, the Facebook bots um, claimed that the last session that we had uh, was spam. So they removed the uh, the link. So I appealed it and um, they'll probably get back to me. But uh, Salman was even also telling me that a, that a very innocuous thing that he put up on TikTok was suddenly taken down. He did a, a critique video of Rudolf Steiner and um, very innocuous, very academic, very, you know, um, and they took it down. So um, right now, these tech companies are acting extremely strange and they're like, just going after people for some of the most bizarre and banal reasons, but that doesn't matter because we have um, we have uh, you know I have an archive of all of this. This is all saved. I put it on YouTube. If YouTube takes it down, I'll put it somewhere else. You know, it's not a not an issue at all. Anywho, let's get cracking into the chapter of Abraham. This is a one session chapter so if we do want to go over an hour that's fine if you have questions and you want issues resolved that's that's cool um we have let's see we have a few people here now okay the wisdom of rapturous love in the word of abraham abraham was called the intimate khalil of god because he had embraced embraced tachalala, and penetrated all the attributes of the divine essence the poet says, I have penetrated the course of the spirit within me, and thus was the intimate of God so-called. In the same way, color permeates that which is colored, providing it be understood that the accident in relation to its substance is not as the thing and the space it occupies, or Abraham was so-called because the reality permeated his form. Either approach is valid since every determination was an appropriate assignation beyond which it does not pass. Do you not understand that the reality is manifest through the attributes of relative beings when it has informed us of that, that itself, even through attributes of deficiency and blame? Do you not understand that the created being is manifest through the attributes of the reality from the first to the last, all of them being appropriate to it, even as the attributes of created beings are appropriate to the reality. The words, praise, be, praise belongs unto God, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, mean that every instance of praise as respecting the one who praises or the one praised reverts to it. To it, the whole matter reverts. In which verse it embraces all attributes without reference to their praiseworthiness or blameworthiness, all being either the one or the other. Know that whenever something permeates another, it is assumed into the, into the other. That which permeates the agent is disguised by that which is permeated, the object of permeation. Thus, the object in this case is the manifest while the agent is unmanifest, the hidden reality. The latter is as nourish, nourishment to the former even as a piece of wool swells and expands because of the water that permeates it. If, on the other hand, the reality is con considered as being the manifest and the creature as being hidden within him, the creature will assume all the names of the reality, the hearing, sight, all his relationships and modes and knowledge. If, however, the creature is considered the manifest and the reality as the unmanifest within him, then the reality is in the hearing of the creature as also in his sight, hand, foot, and all his faculties, as declared in the well-known uh, holy tradition of the Prophet. This is the reference of the Hadith al-Nawafid. The essence as being beyond all these relationships is not, not a divinity since all these relationships originate in our eternally unmanifest essences. It is we in our eternal latency who make it a divinity, 
by being that through which it knows itself as divine. Thus, he is not known as God until we are known. This is a very, very subtle, important point. And um, while the detractors of Ibn Arabi have read into this particular passage that um, he seems to be de-elevating Allah Subhana, that is exactly the opposite of what he's doing. Because what he's asserting implicitly in this specific passage is that uluhiyah, in a sense, is a limitation. So the that, the essence, even transcends the category of uluhiyah, right? And this is the, this is the point that Ibn Arabi is making. So he's not the you know, he's not de-elevating, you know, the, the Allah subhanahu He's raising the independence or the, the reality, the, the haqiqat uluhiyah, even beyond uh, known categories. This is what his detractors just don't get. Muhammad said, he who knows himself knows his Lord. Man arafa nafsu faqad arafa rabbahu. Being the creature who knows God best. Certain sages among them, like Abu Hamid al-Ghazali have asserted that God can be known without any reference to the created cosmos. But this is mistaken. It is true that a primordial eternal essence can be known, but it cannot be known as a divinity unless knowledge of that to which it can be related is assumed. For it is dependent, for it is the dependent, dependent who confirmed the independence of the independent. This is another beautiful dialectic that he's asserting here, right? Um, implied in it is that even the, the category of independence or Kana'a or the name Kani in a sense is a limitation on the unlimitedness of the of the unlimited. However, a further spiritual intuition will reveal the, that that which was necessary to affirm its divinity in none other than the reality itself and that the cosmos of, cosmos of created beings is nothing more than its self-revelation to itself in the forms determined by their eternally unmanifest essences, which could not possibly exist without it. It will reveal also that it manifests itself variously and formally according to the inherent realities and states of the essences, all of which is understood together with the knowledge that in relation to us, it is the divinity. In relation to us, bear this in mind, very key. A final spiritual intuition will show you your forms manifest in it so that some of us are manifest to, to others in the real, al-haq. Know each other and distinguish each other in it. There are those of us who have spiritual knowledge of this mutual recognition in the real, while others have not experienced the plane on which this occurs. I seek refuge in God, lest I be of the ignorant. Audhu billah. And Akun Minat Jahili, the famous verse of the Quran where um, Moses is, is responding to the um, ignorance of the Israelites. As a result of the last two intuitions, it is known that we are determined only through ourselves as essences. Indeed, it is we who determine ourselves through ourselves, which is the meaning of the words. God, to God is the conclusive ar argument. That is, against the veiled ones when they ask the real why it has done with them things contrary to their own aims. Oh God, why, did, why didn't you give me that wife I wanted? Why, Allah subhanahu, why didn't I get that car I wanted or that job I wanted? You know, Why did I mess up my test? Why did I mess up my uh, pay, mortgage payments, etc., etc., etc.? And it made their affair, affair difficult for them. And this is the truth revealed to the Gnostics. For they see that it is not the real that has done with them what it is claimed. And they see that what was done with them came from themselves. It is your own cause, you know, your own uh, place in the causality that you yourself have unleashed in the greater causality of things that is responsible for your condition. You can't blame God for that. For its knowledge of them is according to what they are themselves in their eternal essences. Thus their complaint is nullified, the conclusive argument maintaining with God. If it be asked, what is the point of his saying then, had he wished, lao, the if, he, had he wished, he would have guided you all. We reply, 
that had he in had he wished conveys the denial of a suggestion regarding the impossible for free he only wills that which is which is now bear this in mind this is a this has a very direct bearing on some of the conversations that keep, kept coming up on the theurgy list where people are claiming that they're cursed black magic follows them around they have a generational jinn curse a jinn that has been following them around for generations generations this here from a theurgic point of view is the decisive argument against that kind of fallacious superstitious thinking However, according to rational principles, the same contingency may admit of a thing or its opposite. But in reality, whichever of the two alternative occurs is the one assigned to the contingency in its eternal essence. The meaning, the meaning of he would have guided you is that it would have made clear to you your unmanifest realities. Right? In other words, if you were truly an arif, right? Rather than keep asking questions, why am I um, experiencing such bad luck all the time? Why are my family so messed up? Why are we having a generational curse following us around? Why is this jinn tormenting us? Um, instead, you would be, if you were a true arif, you would be shown the causalities of things on all planes, whether on the spiritual plane or on the material plane of causality as to why you inhabit the condition you do rather than to blame God or, you know, unseen forces, etc. However, it is not granted to everyone by God that his spiritual sight should be open to perceive his essential realities in its latency. For there are those who know and those who do not know. For this reason, it did not will and did not guide them all, nor will it do so. The same applies to the words, if it wills. For how is he to will what is not? Right, and this is a very, very, um, very fine argument, and and has a lot of different Im implications because, um, you know, it is us who are generating in our own minds alternative scenarios to our own condition, right? But our condition is what has been willed from pre-eternity to be the case, right? So therefore, in a sense, these alternative scenarios of what if are the delusions. These are the mohumat of the human mind who wants to hold even the creator of, of the universe to un alternative inf unfoldings that are impossible to unfold based on the essence that every person is already always, right? His will is self-dependent and is an essential attribution dependent on his knowledge, which in turn is dependent on the object of his knowledge, which is you and your essential status. Knowledge has no effect on the object of knowledge, while what is known has an effect on knowledge, bestowing on it of itself what it is. The scriptural revelations were formulated in accordance with what those addressed laid down as regards the eternal measure of response, eternally latent in their essences, and according to reason, which formulation does not necessarily conform to what direct spiritual intuition reveals. Thus, although believers are many, Gnostics endowed with spiritual intuition and unveiling are few. There are none of us uh, but that have a known st station or a known measure, which is what you are in your eternal latency and in accordance with what you are manifest in existence, if, in truth, your reality includes the possibility of being manifest. If it is agreed that existence may be attributed only to the reality and not to you, you will nevertheless, as essence, determine his existence, but only in relation to you. Okay, that, that's this is the unspoken element of this. If it is agreed that you have existence, you're also a determinant. For even though the reality be the determiner, it is for it only to pour existence upon you, while you remain the determinant and the determined. Therefore, praise none other than yourself and blame none other than yourself. Praise is due to the real only as pouring forth existence, which only it may do so and not you. You are its nourishment as bestowing the contents of its self-knowledge, well, it is yours as bestowing existence, 
what is assigned to you being also assigned to it. The order is from it to you be and from you to what you or what he shall be. This, this is a, the amphiboly between the two because it means both. However, you are called the one who is charged, mukallif, but he charges you only in accordance with what your essential and manifest reality bids it. It is not so called since it is not the object. So God is neither object or subject here. Then the poem. He praises me and I praise him. He worships me and I worship him. In my state of existence, I confirm him as on manifest essence, I deny him. He knows me while I know not of him. I also know him and perceive him. Where then is the self-sufficiency? The Qana. Since I help him and grant him bliss, it is for this that the reality created me. For I give content to his knowledge and manifest him. Thus did the message come, its meaning fulfilled in me. It was because Abraham attained to this rank by which he was called the intimate Khalil of God that hospitality became a sacred act. Ibn Masara put him with Michael, Mikael, the archangel, as a source of provisions or risk, provisions being the food of those provided. Food penetrates the essence of the one fed, permeating every part. So also with God, although in its case there are no parts, but only divine stations or names through which its essence is manifest. We are his, as has been shown, as also we belong to ourselves. He has no other becoming except mine. We are his, and we are through ourselves. I have two aspects, he and I, but he is not I in my I. In me is, the in me is the theater of manifestation, and we are for him as vessels. Chapter of Abraham. Questions? Insights, revelations. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Uh, hi, I, I've gone first for the past few weeks, so I think I guess I'll go first again. Go um, so this argument about not knowing your place in the causality, it's sort of, and then complaining about your circumstances in the dunya, if you mm. accept that word, it's sort of taken as reproach, right? Because you're not sure. understanding where you are in, you know, in the chain of things. So what about that awareness? Isn't that awareness also a result of causality? And does that not brook of course that it is. such reproach? Sure, of course it is. But um, just, just as the Quran teaches and Hadith tells us and other teachings show us, um, there has to be that element of striving, right? This is the, which is the more, you know, the, the meaning of jihad, you know, in okay. its, its so if we do not strive in life, we do not know in life, right? So if you do not engage in the inner jihad, not just, I mean, not taking this concept as a, just a flourish or an ornament, but if you are not striving in yourself in the divine pathways at all time in every little thing that you're doing, then you, you don't get that kind of insight. And that is actually, an, a, 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 this is what is, Ibn Arabi is implying about the taklif and the one who is being mukallif, obligated, right? This is the obligation that is put on, on every created human, you know, to strive for their own, you know, realization of the reality of things as they truly are, as the prayer of the Prophet says, Allahumma arina haqaqala shakama O oh Lord, uh, oh God, show me the reality of things as they truly are. But um, you need, it, it is required for you to strive, you must strive to get there, right? So the difference between an Arif Billah and even, you know, a Salik Billah and the rest of the, you know, humanity, the Awam, is that whereas the Arif is constantly striving, it's constantly refining themselves, constantly, you know, trying to strip uh, the deficiencies, the Naqa'is from their own mind and their heart and everything, the rest of humanity is either taking things for granted, and when they take things for granted, then this veil occurs in their perception of things as they truly are, 
So rather than blame themselves for their own lack of insight, they want to externalize that and blame God or whatever, um, or even the chain of causality, karma itself for um, their condition. And with Muslimin, and as, as we had, you know, we've seen on, on the list, the Islamic theurgy list, um, where this question was coming up almost like on a daily basis at one point, where people believe they're cursed, right? Rather than look at the bigger picture and their place in that bigger picture within the social setting, you know, why am I, you know, why am I feeling the way I'm doing? Why is nothing I'm doing working? Why is my life this way? Why is my life that? Rather than ask that particular question about why, right? To take that question back to themselves, to analyze, you know, the course of their own life events um, as far back, back as they can take it. Um, to try to pinpoint, you know, mistakes or misperceptions that have occurred along the way, and then to rectify that with a technique, which with for the Sufis and zikr and dua and, and the whole practice, you know, the the tafakkur and and the self analysis and whatnot, and then to fix the problem, they externalize it and they resign to their problem rather than resigning to God, and this is this is a form of, in a sense, it's a form of shirk which all everybody is doing, rather than to understand the nature of their own problem, right? They're trying to attribute that problem beyond themselves, not take that responsibility that, that is their own um, in rectifying the problem, right? And there's a warped psychology around that. As a counselor, I have dealt with cases like that time and time again, where a lot of people get a benefit from being in the, in the negative condition that there are rather than to extract themselves from that negative condition um, and strive to get themselves out of that situation, they get a payback from being in that condition because it validates um, their conception or misconception about how bad the world is and how bad their life is, right? And in a sense, Ibn Arabi is trying to point out to this very reality is that you cannot blame God for your personal problems. You cannot blame God for being misguided right? It's your own lack of effort, your own lack of insight, et cetera, that is responsible for the condition that you're in. So don't blame God. God is already, um, what God is responsible for in giving you existence is, all, is already always fulfilled, right? As the, as the wahib al-wujud, the giver of existence. That, 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 that is what God does, right? Everything else, you as the determinant and as the determiner in the, in the small case D, Everything else is then, from that point forward, your responsibility. And, by the way, that, the real, is already infused within you. So your your responsibility now is to become increasingly more and more, more and more, more aware of that in your own personal life, in your own individual existence. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This is what I'm saying. The, the, you know, Ibn Arabi, the implications of things that he's saying, whether in the Fusus or in the Futuat al makiya are beyond just like, you know, profound nuggets of wisdom that we just put on a, you know, that we inscribe and put on a wall. And um, they have very immediate implications because of the way that he's dealing with scripture. Um, he is bringing this immediately forward, right? Um, and, you know, I have used some of these insights in a few sessions, counseling sessions with clients I had, they weren't Muslims, but I um, I brought some of, you know, some of the things that I have gleaned from Ibn Arabi into my counseling sessions, and it really has helped people, you know, because he is explaining a very non-dual dialectic, uh, and that this is also the way that the mind itself is operating when analyzing its own problems. You know, people don't um, self-analyze themselves by using Aristotelian syllogisms or laws of excluded middle, you know, that the emotional content of how people self-analyze is, is itself in a ma many ways non-dual. So if you take this sort of model that Ibn Arabi is offering and just apply it in as a methodology in, in counseling people, um, it really does, not everybody, but in, in a few of the clients that I used to have, it really empowered them to then go away and start to solve their own problems in the process uh, and come back, you know, hopefully transformed in their perspective about their own problems that then they can do something about themselves rather than make them dependent for, you know, for 
years and years on therapy or even you know cocktail of psychiatric drugs etc whenever i i encounter this idea in ibn arabi i i come up against this this question about um like the the question of responsibility um who who is it that's able to take responsibility because it sounds like he's he's saying that it's the it's the ein it's the ein thabita um and i was wondering like is it is it me the i that i identify with that's the one that is capable of of doing this this kind of work that you're talking about or do i have to realize some kind of i i have to like ascend to my pre-eternal self in order to uh take responsibility for the kind that that he's talking about well you have to ascend to them that's where the striving the, the inner jihad comes into play that's where this question becomes most apropos um because while we have not fully come into awareness of that in its full implication we are veiled from ourselves basically but as we deepen our realization of our own aim then the causalities that are around us become more evident. So the question of why becomes to discipline, because then you realize what the what what the um, the status of that ain of that is yourself is and how it occurs in the greater chain of things, the greater causality of things. And this is why in many traditions, as as a, as a given mystic or a, a wayfarer. Um, comes closer and closer to God, all their quirks, all their queries, all their complaints, et cetera, about the life begins to drop more and more and more. It just gets stripped because as the, the further inner you go, the or the more you ascend, depending on what language you're using, um, the more from this height, these considerations at the bottom become relevant. They're not relevant anymore because you also begin to see for yourself what the nature of the problem has been or what the misperception of the problem has been and why things are as they are and you are as you are and you when you get to that height um the judgments that you may have at this lower level also just fall away you know it is as, as it is in a sense what ibn arabi is doing which i find extremely profound is that he is giving a very didactic explanation of what that hadith we have from um, Jafar al-Sadiq where he talks, when, when they ask him, you know, what's the situation? Is it predetermination or, you know, free will? And he says, al-amr bayna amrei. And in this particular cha chapter, it's, it, the matter is between the two. It's neither complete free will nor complete predestination. And th in this particular chapter of the Fusus, in my humble opinion, this is exactly what Ibn Ari is doing. He's laying this whole argument out of what the Imam is saying in a very didactic, albeit in a kind of a um, non-dual dialectical kind of way. But this is all about you. You know, you it, it, it is incumbent upon you to engage in that process of the saluk, of the self-discovery, to go in yourself and push and strive and Fight yourself, if necessary, within your own mind to untangle um, the, the chains and knots that accumulate during the course of your life and to reach your own fitra. You know, once you do that, and that's, another, you know, the, getting to your fitra is another way to saying to getting to your aina thabit. Um, so once you get to that stage, then the nature of what occurred to you at one point in time as a problem begins to manifest itself as something else. It's just like alchemy says, um, you know that the poison is the gift. So what you perceive as the as the poison is actually um, a significant element of the process of the great work itself to create the opus. And this is something I've been trying in many different ways to say on that list, but very few people understand it because it's of its non dialectical or non dualistic kind of uh, framework. But Ibn Arabi, in my opinion, he really, really uncovers all of this. Beautifully. Muhammad Ali, you had a question? Yes. Uh, salam, Sheikh. Salam, everybody. Alaikum salam. Uh, thank you for for all of this session, Sheikh, uh, for your yeah. time. 
and for everything. I it struck me that, for example, on the Alba, right? You have that part where um it it asks God for uh, 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 it is uh, that is of your like your quests or something like that, right? And be ahbabuha. It's most beloved ones. Uh, all of your requests are beloved. And so I think it has something to do with the title. What do you think about the title and this, the whole, what Abel in Arabi relates to it? Can you reframe your question? It's a bit, I, I'm a bit um, not clear what you're asking me. Sorry about the, the title. The that title is, uh, of the chapter. Yeah, the title is people. Yeah, he chose for these chapter. Yeah, well, love. This is a this is a great yeah. question for everybody has their own um, theories. But one thing that that the early commentators, beginning with Konawi, point out is that the titles of the chapter are basically laying out a unfolding of the stages of God, right? So, for example, the chapter of Adam is the Fasal Ilahiya. So this is the 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 point at which the, of the unfolding of God begins, right? Um, then the chapter of Seth is the chapter of expiration. So this is then once the unfolding has started, then God is blowing existence in, you know, you know, but he's uh, in exhaling existence into being, right? So this relates to Seth. Then the next chapter chapter of Noah is the word of um, exaltation or subuhia, which is another way of saying glorification. These two mean the same thing in Arabic. Um, and this in itself has a transcendental function. So um, in Qaysari and Jandi especially, they really spend a lot of pages explaining this, um, the difference between subuhia wa qudusia. Um, and both of these are elements of purification and transcendence. And so Noah occurs in this third chapter because, um, and then when you take the narrative of Noah and his people where, you know, he's pushing this transcendent. So even Ari put him as the third uh, of this of the chapter. And then the next part, uh, the chapter after that, holiness, is then again another element of, of transcendentalizing or transcendizing, right? Um, and then finally, once that those two processes of, of transcendence itself have expanded themselves, as it were, then the next stage is what the next stage is, from an Arabic perspective, is um, the rapturous love, right? So, you know, the, the wisdom, the hikmah is muhayyamina, and so on and so on. So what he's trying to convey through these chapter headings in itself is also an unfolding process. So these chapter headings themselves are also conveying to us information. They're not random at all. Um, he's doing it in a, on a very deliberate basis. And then once we then read the chapter itself, um, then we begin to understand what the greater process around these chapter headings are like. So paying attention to these chapter headings um, in itself is very important because they, they are the keys uh, to the to the overall argument for each chapter. Zachary, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I guess I just wanted to clarify the um, uh, the idea of God's knowledge being dependent on the objects of his knowledge, like what he drops there. And it's mm -hmm. something that I guess has been brought up like in previous it's chapters, not, um, he's not, not saying it is dependent, as in, like, for example, um, a child is dependent on the mother or, or father or whatever. Um, the way he's, he's basically saying it's determined, but determined from whose perspective? Okay. Um, this determination, knowledge, let's take knowledge as a universal. There's different ways that we can look at. You can look at knowledge. Um, as a universal from the point of view of an archetype, right? That is disengaged from any material instantiation. But simultaneously, you could then also take knowledge as a prototype that is engaged, okay? 
So what he's trying to say is that the no, the, the the object of that knowledge, right, is then determining the prototypical in knowledge in itself, right? The disengaged archetypal celestial knowledge is the knowledge of God itself, right? The object that occurs in its instantiation in the material spatial temporal world um, is one of infinite facets of that universal knowledge. But in let us take in a a specific point in time, right? Let, let's say like what at this moment, something is known, right? And the way that that thing is known is colored by the object in that specific time. But he's not saying that that object and and um, that object of knowledge is not capable of of um, of evolving in its in in what is understood as its contents over time. He's not saying that at all. In fact, this is then. This in itself becomes the basis of Mullah Sadra's metaphysics of the Harika Johariya, the, the transubstantial motion, okay, which becomes a very then a very, very dynamic thing where the um what is known about a particular object of knowledge is undergoing this incessant transformation such that then you cannot really pin down um that object of knowledge in its con or the contents. You can't pin down the contents of that object of knowledge. Um, at any given time, because it's constantly self-transforming. So, uh, would it be, um, I guess, correct to say that that transformation is what we would call, like, uh, sort of our free will or our like ability to self-determine, and then the sure. archetype is like the providence, what we call providence. Way. Sure, you yeah. could you could talk it, you could you could take it that way, but you could also simultaneously argue, as Molasadra does. That this is also transformation is also its substrate. It's 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 determining element. So within it is the deter it's uh there's a determining element within that motion, like that yes. transformation, and that's like kind of relates to our ability to like have our own um self-knowledge and and like engaging in that sort of like internal jihad, which you mentioned before. So it's kind of like it's a we. Uh, I I don't know. If, I wouldn't know the specific term. Like it doesn't really fit between uh, libertarian free will or like total determinism. I I I, I that's don't it. know and if you, if there's anything. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. This is exactly the yeah. point of view of Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam, where where he's asked this question. You know, what is the situation? Is it is it free will or is it predetermined? And he says the matter is between the two. So it's neither. It's both. We're somewhere in between the two, or as he says, al and bain and ring. The matter is between the two. It's neither one or the other. Yeah, that, that's a. Uh, I, I guess um, that is. It's kind of hard. I think <laughs> it, it goes back to people, the, the people like being dissatisfied with their life because it's kind of like explaining that or understanding this is like it, it takes a bit of like a lot of thought, and oh, especially yeah. like com compared More to your own life and how things go it's yeah. experience inner self experience which only a saluk a real um spiritual wayfaring will give you thanks yeah that, that's definitely something to chew on because that was like the part of the chapter that i know in my, in, that probably ruffled some feathers i guess if uh sure. people read that and like they they saw it i oh people who are you know because they're different because the idea of god's knowledge and it's like it's like an all like in certain trends of thought, it's like, you know, the highest, like there's no uh, like sort of um, uh, differentiation or discussion about it. It's just like, it's the all, it's the most, it's the highest thing. And there's like, you know, it's, and it, it, is. It, it covers everything and it covers yeah. everything, but it's like, it's like all of it. There's no, um, because then you get into the idea that it's, you know, everything's preordained and for not, there's foreknowledge of everything. It's like, it, it gets into a, bit, a lot of like, like I, like we just said that whole, like, how do we, you know, how do we deal with God's knowledge is like a huge issue that, you know, a lot of people well, have given their opinions about. Here, here, Ibn Arabi is, is, is answering this question very decisively. It's like, how do you deal with God's knowledge? You deal with your own. That's how you deal with it, because of the issue of the permeation. And this again goes back, you know, you, you're never going to realize a God that is external to yourself. That becomes idolatry in a sense, Right. So that's why he's putting that hadith, which actually is by Ali rather than the prophet. Um, you know, he who knows himself knows his Lord. 
um, it is through that endeavor on your part where the, you actually get to realize what the knowledge of God of you in, uh, specifically is actually all about. So you you're basically responsible to yourself, and by being genuinely responsible to yourself, you you become responsible to God by implication. And yeah, that does thematically tie into the uh, chapter of Noah, the imminence, transcendence, that yes. you just said. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to make, we're making idols out of not only um, uh, literal idols, but idols out of, you know, uh, whatever, like, specific opinion you have on, you know, uh, God's uh, ability to, you know, personally do this or do that. And like, it kind of like the externalization and the, trans like, overly transcendentalizing the divine is like, I guess that's kind of like that is the issue because um people will say issue. okay why does he just like say why doesn't god just come save me and you know wave his magic wand and you know well, fix everything he, he that's kind of like the because you're not allowing yeah. it but this is the thing you're also not allowing that to occur because you know god has already always deposited that that agent of saving within you and this is also a meaning um, when the prophet was once asked by one of these Bedouins, you know, you tell us to have tawakkul, to trust in God. Well, can I have to trust in God if I don't, you know, um, rope up my camel? Can I trust God that this <laughs> camel won't, won't wander into the desert, won't come back? The prophet said it to him, you know, trust in God, but tie your camel. Yeah, that 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 that's uh you know that that kind of like folk wisdom i guess it, it's kind of people it's true but people don't like like to accept that it's like uh they want you know they want something more sophisticated like quote-unquote sophisticated but it's not really and like it's yeah they can't accept the simple truths i guess is the yeah. way i would say it yeah and actually the most sophisticated truth is all usually the most simple one <laughs> rather than this <laughs> elaborate you know kind of explanation which we find in, in multiple philosophical systems don't get anywhere per the hadith okay. of ali alayhi salam he says it's beautifully in that hadith um al ilm nuqta kathiruha al jahilu knowledge is a single point that the ignorant have multiplied <laughs> 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 um, can you say a couple of words about the immutable archetypal essences like on a personal level um because <laughs> i think there's there's uh there's a point in between imminence and transcendence with the concept of immutable archetypal essences on on an individual level sure because uh on on the one hand it could seem like a condemnation, like if a person's immutable archetypal essence is, <clears throat> let's just say, doesn't go very high. Mm. That's like kind of like a damnation for that person, right? For eternity. So that can't be that can't be the case. Wait, w just remember this. And this Ibn Arabi said this a couple of chapter chapters ago. From the perspective of the essence right? Everything is equal. So there is no issue of damnation or salvation immediately uh, perceptible from the perspective of the essence, from the greater absolute perspective, right? So then what is being determined as good or bad about that is something that is unfolding within, the, within that instantiation, perhaps not even latent within the immutable archetypal essence, perhaps it's something else completely different so that's what i'm saying is that the more knowledge you get of this within yourself by yourself right um then that in itself has the potential of um of balancing imbalances that are not understood in other words every imbalance that the mind is experiencing unless it's chemical you know or biological and even that um Every imbalance that you're experiencing about the world is an imbalance, is, is, a, is being veiled from your own nature, right? But once you are less and less and less and less veiled from your own nature, then this in itself balances itself. Like I, what I said, that gentleman that asked me in um, at the Theosophical House, you know, what do I have to, you know, I, do I have to get prepared to do the mantra, et cetera? 
And you know, I basically said to him, look, the mantra, the vicar itself is the centering agent. Rather than go through all this elaborate process to prepare yourself to do the mantra, do the mantra and allow that to center you. Because that is the center. And so if you look at the spiritual path itself from that perspective, um, rather than trying to gauge where a problem is, whether there is a issue of imbalance, whether there's a, um, you know, to use theological language, a damnation or a salvation or something of that ilk, um, do, you know, go in search of that for yourself and discover that for yourself to understand what that um, thing that you're asking about actually really is. And oftentimes people are surprised. I mean, you know, you read in the lives of a lot of these mystics and saints, you know, that they start off at a certain point with certain judgments either about themselves and the world. And as they proceed through their path, everything changes about that. What they like, for example, even things that they had held sacred at one point in time in the past before they even started become the very opposite of what they thought it was. I mean, this occurred in my own life, 100%. You know, so so then, like that, the idea of immutability that applies to the highest uh, essence. But I mean, on an individual human level, I don't. You know, the word immutable doesn't quite apply because. Well, but that 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 on the individual human level, each individual human is a participates in that immutability by virtue of being essenced. Yeah. Okay. So it's not a handicap. I mean, because uh, it could it could be if you misinterpret it or if you don't understand it, it could be like construed as some sort of a handicap that a person's born with. Like that's like a like a ceiling that you can't go beyond because that's your immutable archetypal essence that you were born with. But that, I know that's a misunderstanding. And I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. I mean, look, there are examples of this even in scripture, for example, um, in either the Quran or the Hadith literature and this, you know, the stories of the prophets, Moses, according to us, had a lisp. Okay? But Aaron did it. Yet Moses was, a, was the law-giving prophet. So, you know, in his encounter with the Pharaoh, it was Aaron who was doing most of the speaking for Moses because Moses had a lisp. Um, so that, from one perspective, you can look at that as a handicap, but... Moses was still the law-giving prophet. He, you know, brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, according to the narrative, um, and the rest we know. Thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? Hassan, been quiet today. <laughs> I have a long list of questions, and okay. that is the reason I keep silent. <laughs> okay. uh, so, Uh, in uh, one of uh, the the places, uh, I will uh, also give me page number in the Arabic once you once you do. Uh, it is uh, eighty nine of uh, Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmed. Uh, it is the last uh, paragraph. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you explain it? وَإِنَّمَا وَرَدَ الْخِطَابُ الْإِلَهِيُّ بِحَسَبِ مَا تَوَاطَ عَلَيْهِ الْمُخَاطَبُونَ mm -hmm. did, did you find found it? Yes. Uh, وَمَا أَعْطَاهُ النَّظَرُ الْعَقْلِي مَا وَرَدَ الْخِطَابُ عَلَى مَا يُعْتِهِ الْكَشْفِ uh, وَلِذَلِكَ كَثُرَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَقَلَّ الْعَارِفُونَ أَصْحَابُ الْكُشُوفِ uh, mm -hmm. In this uh, paragraph I have... Uh, Several uh, questions. This is what we just covered, but... which what, what I was just talking about. Uh, so, uh, 
but uh, from the uh, perspective of the intellect, uh, always uh, there are always alternatives, uh, parallel universes, uh, as you were saying. But uh, from a, a perspective of what actually is, it is just one thing uh, which uh, uh, God uh, wills. And mm. then uh, here, uh, uh, in the end of the uh, paragraph, it says, that is the reasons that the believers are many, but the the Arifun, the diagnostics, the, the knowers, they are uh, uh, because um, what he's saying here, this is very important and true Arif. We're talking about people who have real unveiling. A true Arif has now understood and gleaned and seen with their own eyes they have seen with their own eyes the reality of things as they truly are so then they, from their perspective you don't even need any more of it to ask the question why or lao in order to ask if lao right the the basic moment the basic the believer um, doesn't have because of their unveiling because they've not done the sunuk they don't have access to a synthetic understanding of why so they ask the question like God why did you do this to me God why did it, why did this happen why did that happen why did my wife leave me why did my dog die why did I fail to pay my mortgage payment etc okay um, but. From the perspective of the Arif, someone who's gone as deep as they possibly can and have had unveiling, like even Arabi has, um, this question doesn't occur because the, all the causalities involved are known to them. And so what he's saying is that God only acts within the established. And so the whys and wherefores that human beings then project on given situations related to themselves this is the wah. This is the delusion. So in essence, things unfold as they should unfold. And also they unfold as they should unfold because what unfolds is determined in that ain athabita. It's always been that very thing to unfold in that particular way. Of course, you know, there, you know, I mean, Ibn Arabi is not saying that there are not um, other possibilities of unfoldment within the essence. He's not saying that at all. But from the position of the will, the mashia, rather than the irada, the difference between these two have to be, um, the subtlety between these two have, has to be taken on board. But from the point of view of the mashia to Allah, right, what unfolds is as it should be. And the reason is simple, he puts it, is because that responsibility from the Mashiatullah is to be the Wahib al-Wujud, to give existence, to be the donor of existence. And that's it, that's it. Everything else that comes in that, whether good or bad, is as it is. So then to ask the question, you know, God, why didn't you create me with, for example, with a bigger, you know, as a taller person? or more better endowed, whatever, you know, whether financially or physically or whatever. You know, the, the, the question is dumb because you, you have been determined as you have been determined. That is what it is. So um, this is also goes back to the question of adab that even Arabi constantly hammers in, the etiquette, the correct adab towards Allah, is that, you know, when you ask that question, why you are being, you are having lack of adab. But it's also understandable because you don't know any better. But the Arifun know better because they have seen the realities of things as they truly are. And so they understand why things are in the way they are. That doesn't mean that you don't have the power then to, you know, kind of, you know, change or alter or, you know, transform things or direct them into other places, that sort of thing. That's not what he's saying at all. But as they are, at that particular point, when a particular question by somebody, a, a believer is asked, why? You know, why is my life in such a rut? Um, Ibn Arabi is answering that question. 
And then the difference between those who ask that question and those who don't ask that question. The moment and the Arif. Uh, also, uh, is it correct my impression that here the uh, correlation is the mu'minun uh, are the people who are on the level of intellect, which uh, the intellect have always many uh, possibilities Aid. to happen. Aid. It has, the, it is the intellect, the, the agl, as, as, as the, the root of the master of the word agala, you know, tells us in Arabic, is a binding, right? Um, so... And also then the word agida, which comes from, you know, the, the, the root agada, which is even stronger meaning of, of to bind. Um, so that is the problem with the rational intellect is that because it is only operating within a circumscription of the mind. So it needs context, subtext, you know, substrates, that kind of thing to even be able to glean X, Y, and Z. Whereas with, um, super rational knowledge it has liberated itself from those constrictions it is now capable of seeing in a variety of, of different ways inside context outside context within subtext outside subtext so it is not bound that way and when it's not bound that way then um this binarism that the mind usually operates with or and then in systems of logic where we have the binaries of of a not A are no longer applicable to it because it could see, you know, it can see holistically in a non-dualistic way around a given issue. Uh, sorry. Uh, so and uh, one more thing. Uh, so uh, the uh, language or the style in which uh, Wahi, the divine uh, revelation, uh, speak uh, to to uh, us. Uh, what I get, uh, I may be wrong, uh, what would you say? Uh, the, the Sheikh Muhyiddin, he's saying the style, for example, if we take Quran or uh, uh, any other scripture, God is speaking on the level of, of Mu'minun, the, the, the level of Akil, because uh, that is the level where the, the masses of uh, people are. And uh, because of that, uh, for example, uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala is saying, if uh, you do that, then uh, that will happen exactly in the level of uh, intellect. Uh, if so and so, then so and so. Uh, the, the alternative, uh, the possible al alternatives. Uh, but uh, the, the level of uh, cash, it is uh, something else. Uh, what would you say about that? Uh, the, the level on which uh, a revelation is, is, is speaking. The level, the, the level at which the re revelation is speaking, it sees all of these alternative unfoldings, outcomes, possibilities simultaneously. And also then in, in their particulars, both as a universal movement and as a particular instantiation. This is what Cash will do. Um, because there's no veil anymore into people understanding that particular dynamic within themselves, why they have responded the way they have, they have um, what uh, trajectories of causalities, their responses to certain issues may have elicited and unleashed. All of this from the level of cash is known. It's also another way of saying, as Ibn Arabi says um, earlier in the Fusus and elsewhere, it is one way that one understands one qadar, one's determination from God. From God. Right, so that knowledge once you get into the the heart of the your own ainathabita, right? When you've gotten in there, you understand all of this. You see it because you see it; it shows it to you. Right? You are not you are no longer veiled by yourself. Okay, and your your own mental cognitive projections of things. There's an immediacy tasting to your own condition. At that point, you see it. And that is the difference between 
you know, normal cognitive, normal cognitive or ratiocinative function of trying to derive conclusions from premises, et cetera, versus um, unveiling the cache. Thank you very much. Susan. You're very welcome. Anybody else? No? Mohamed Ali, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to comment about uh, how, for example, in this case, Abraham, right? Uh, he, mm -hmm. Just now we have the, the aid of sacrifice and uh, how it has to do with this, uh, like, uh, not, oh, oh, I mean, following what what God had decreed for one oneself, and uh, <clears throat> and how Abraham talks about like Islam as I as this sub universal submission. Mm -hmm. Well, as we as we learned in the previous chapter, um, the sacrifice that God Subhanahu was asking Abraham was not of, um, of Isaac or Ishmael, depending on which version of the narrative one follows. But according to Ibn Arabi, which is, I think is the best gloss on the story, it was being, he was being asked to sacrifice himself, where in the process of dreaming, um, since God strikes symbols, right? As we read constantly as a refrain throughout the Quran, Allah mathal, you know, yet there Allah lamthal, Constantly, this is being said throughout the Quran so that people don't take things literally. Um, since we're dealing with the world of the botan in the dream state, and if God is commanding Abraham to kill his son, he's telling him to kill him in his naps with Isaac or Ishmael in the dream being a symbolism or a similitude for Abraham himself. Yeah, and just like has to do with what you were saying about striving on the path. Yes. God and knowing that. Yes. And so that this is then this dream of Abraham and the command of God itself becomes a symbol for the Salik, the wayfarer, the seeker to at some point, um, you know, annihilate their nafs or move from their status of the nafs, Amara bil su, the, the soul commanding to evil into the lawama, the, the blame, self blaming, then you know, further deeper into the mutma'ina, razia, marzia, etc., as the Quran lays out. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with courage too, like how Abraham is said to uh, pass through the fire, right, and face yes. exile and everything to do with that. Yeah. Thanks. Very welcome. Um, yeah, so I, I've been trying to, just the basic theme of this chapter, I've been trying to understand it. Um, so I, I'll just lay out what I have. Sure. Um, and then I'll, so on the one hand, there's the God is unmanifest in the creature. Uh, the creature manifests God. And that's God permeating the creature. And I think that's the side where, where God is bestowing existence. And then on the other side, it's, it's the reverse. Mm. So the creature is, is unmanifest in God. <clears throat> God is manifesting the creature. And there the creature is, is permeating or, or feeding God. Mm. And there is where uh, the creature bestows the contents of God's self-knowledge. And I wonder, like, the, the first that, one in that locus in that particular locus in okay. each particular locus yeah so i don't know if this is the the right if i'm on the right track here but on the one side it seems like it's what's being talked about is just the just like material existence we we are the the outward manifestation of of god's existence 
But I, the other side is a little bit obscure. And I wonder if what's being talked about there is something like a like an esoteric perception, like yes, that where through like imagination we we give form to to the revelations of God. Yes, it means that. It means other things as well, but that's one of its meanings, definitely. Yeah. It does mean that very thing. Okay. Yeah. What else what else would you say? Well, I mean means? to know God in the world, right? To know God, even as a axiom, right? We're not even entering into actual blow, you know, actual tasting. Um, this occurs through humans, right? Without us, right? Um, without us, other members of creation may not know God. Although even Arabi elsewhere says that all creatures, all things, even the rocks and stones, everything knows God. Okay. But from a certain vantage point, since humanity is the ahsan al makhlul, right? Um, the most perfect knowledge of God in this planet is deposited within the human being. So that in in that way, without us, if humanity were to annihilate itself tomorrow, until the Lord, uh, the Lord of existence decides to do something else and bring another creation into being, um, that would be a period in which there would be no knowledge of God. So we are the angels, and it says that in that final poem, we are the vessels. We are the vessels for the knowledge of God, or the most perfect knowledge of God to all other elements of creation on this planet right now. And this in itself is a very important um, kind of point of departure, because when you think about it, and then you look at the state of the world today, um, and what secular modernism has done to, I mean, on the one hand, it's criticism of the authoritarian nature of religion is right. But on the other hand, um, by throwing the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, which secular modernism has done, um, and you know the world that we see around ourselves, uh, in a sense, humanity is killing the world by rejecting God, right? Not, I didn't say rejecting an Amida or rejecting a doctrine or even rejecting the Sharia, but rejecting God. So um, even for you know, even though many lauded laud Nietzsche's statements, um, I think it's in the, either the Antichrist or Ekhoma where he says God is dead. Um, you look at a statement not by by what how nice it sounds at that immediate moment or in the immediate context of when it is said, but you look at a statement based on the implications of that statement beyond itself. The death of God proclaimed by Nietzsche, um, whether he intended it or not, um, gave us an entire century of one of the most destructive centuries that humanity has ever witnessed, that what was more con compact in its destructiveness than the last 2,000 years that it preceded it. Two world wars, industrial mass slaughter, the complete and total um, ecological devastation of this planet, the the um, poisoning of the oceans, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on and on it goes. Great, yeah, we've had progress, scientific material understanding about technology and all of that, but on the most basic elements of being human, we have lost sight. And in the process, we have become destructive, and this proclamation of the death of God was one of its instrumental causes to that end, well, whatever Nietzsche meant by it ultimately right so this there is is an example to you of how human beings give god the real true living god um in their personal lives and in their um actions and thoughts and, and etc throughout the world they give that god life and how in a sense in a sense um what the current collective of humanity is doing is basically it's sort of like a deicide for lack of a better concept 
And but then understand that when you do that, you're ultimately killing yourself. This is the, then we, this becomes a suicide. So proclaiming the death of God is also a, a simultaneous proclamation of one's own death as a species, as a type. So instead of being ahsan al mahlu from that point, you want, one turns oneself into asfal al mahlu the most lowest of the of, of the creations. And the proof is in the pudding. I mean, we've seen it, what, what, what has come about over the last 100, 200 years. And this, you know, you know, I've, I've had this conversation many times with people, and particularly with um, since the so-called sexual revolution, we have witnessed a massive explosion in mental illness to, with people throughout the world. And I work in this industry, in the counseling industry, and um, you know, clients that I have, it always comes down to these sorts of issues when you break down their problems. It always comes down to relationship problems, and it's because of you know betrayals and broken relationships and marriages and abuse and all of that kind of stuff has has brought them you know to to a session with me, and you then see what the society what the society is doing with that, um, especially in 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 disciplines like psychiatry. So they you know they say well since we can't solve the problem because this is a you know this is a social phenomena that is now out of the control of psychotherapy um, to deal with and, and resolve. So we have to, you know, we have to contain the problem. So we have to manufacture drugs in order to at least make people functional. But this then, in a sense, it messes with um, the biochemistry and the natural biology of the human body and their, especially their brain chemistry. And it makes them even worse and cuts them off even more. From that grounding, that fitra, that 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 you know, that spiritual root of themselves. So these are the implications, as it were, um, of humans rejecting um, the divinity or spirituality, whatever whatever term, concept, whatever you want to define it. With. Anybody else? Ben? Uh, just one more question, Sheikh. Um, so okay, can you uh, give some uh, explanation of uh, the levels of God knowledge which are presented here by Sheikh Muhyiddin? Mm -hmm. The level when you know the Ilah by the Me'luh, the, the 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 science uh, the the creature which all points to God the one level then the second level you know God by God and the third level you know everything differentiate everything in in God uh, this uh... the three journeys that Ibn Arabi is is, is laying out that the Sufis talk about and Mullah Sadra writes about as as the um, he doesn't talk well. He kind of implies the fourth journey as well um, throughout. It's implied. But three of the journeys are being explicitly delineated. So the first journey from the creature to God, the second journey from God to God, the third journey from God in God, or God to God. These are the journeys of the soul that, 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 uh, that Ibn Arabi is putting his finger on. So al خالق إلى الحق الحق إلى الحق الحق في الحق. These are the three journeys. And then the final one is الحق إلى الخالق. That's the final one. It's the arc of ascent and descent. Anybody else? Okay, um, so let us begin for, as of next week, the, the next chapter, the chapter of Isaac. This is also going to be a one chapter uh, session, and the zikr for that is Yahak. 
So um, start to recite the zikr of Yahak, O Truly Real. And we will cover this chapter of Isaac next week. And there is going to be crossover, as you've probably seen, from one chapter to the next. There's a lot of crossover with, to what Ibn Arabi is saying. So one thing that he's mentioning, for example, related to Abraham, he says it in the previous chapter of Enoch. And then what he's going to cover, <clears throat> a part of what he's going to cover in the following chapter, he covers in the chapter of Abraham. Um, this is an okay chapter. Um, it is kind of a, a continuation of what he said in the previous one, although he does introduce a few new things as well. And um, we'll meet at the same time, um, same place. So, Yahak until next week. <laughs>